This episode and others like it are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support my channel and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. This is a video about why Uber and the whole gig economy sucks, and also about how more and more jobs are getting gigified. Since this topic's been floating around in the background for 10 years now, let's start with something recent. 72% of drivers in the US are saying that one of the considerations of their signing up to drive on Uber was actually inflation. Life is getting more expensive. They need to mm -hmm. uh, pay extra for their groceries. So on the supply side, we may be actually benefiting from the inflationary okay. environment. I want to dig into the, the clip I just played is a delicious little treat. In this clip, Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi is on CNBC doing a big oopsie and openly admitting that his company benefits from people having less money. In this case, because of inflation. He's a happy little guy because people are flocking to drive for Uber out of desperation. And that means he gets to tell investors the line is going up this quarter. Just look at that smile. I could honestly end the video here, because nothing I can say will ever top a tech CEO transparently describing how he plans to make money off an economic crisis, pushing thousands of Americans closer to food insecurity, and then smiling. But I am a glutton for watch time, so onward with the rest of the video. That clip is only the tip of the iceberg. Uber, and the economic model it's come to represent, is about a lot more than profiteering off inflation and sudden explosions in poverty. You might have heard the term Uberization before, or platform capitalism, or simply the gig economy. Apps like Uber, Lyft, Grubhub, TaskRabbit, Fiverr, and all the other Uber but for blank apps have unleashed onto society a supposedly new and disruptive economic model. Its advocates, and these apps themselves, describe the gig economy as a whole new way to work. A whole new society, reimagined from the ground up with futuristic technology at its core, and in which an unprecedented number of people will get the freedom to set their own hours, work from anywhere, be their own boss, and if they work hard, rake in big bucks. But of course, rather unsurprisingly, this is all BS. Every part of it, including the idea that any of this is new. Let's first start with the money thing, specifically driver's wages, because it's a good entry point into understanding not only what this economic model really is, but also why it's become such a staple. Figuring out how much Uber drivers, or any other gig workers make, is a headache for everyone, including gig workers themselves. Inconsistent hours, demand, supply, tips, surge pricing, app policies, location, driver data-based algorithms, and so on mean that there is no normal situation from which to extrapolate a universal estimate, despite there being years of data at this point. There's no one number that really tells the whole story, and the question, how much does an Uber driver make, unfortunately doesn't have a single answer. Nonetheless, two things are certain. One, it's a lot less than they should be, and two, Uber lies and inflates its numbers, by a lot. Back in 2014, for example, Uber used to say that the median salary of its New York drivers was 90 k a year. A pretty good sum, more than the city's average salary and way above minimum wage. With this number that the company was very proud of, Uber was telling potential drivers that it could offer a salary on par with a job that requires a college degree, but with the only barrier to entry being owning a car. If this sounds too good to be true, it's because it is. It didn't take long for reporters to look into it, and driving for Uber full-time absolutely does not end with 90 k in workers' pockets. In reality, reporters estimated that New York's Uber drivers made around 12 bucks an hour, or about 25000 a year full-time. In other words, under the poverty line for a family of four. And astute observers will have recognized that 25 k is, believe it or not, actually a lot less than 90 k. Admittedly, though, this is just one calculation made pretty anecdotally. More recently, it's been estimated that Uber drivers' earnings are even lower, around 350 bucks a month on average, and 155 at the median. These numbers are, again, hard to truly understand, because they lump together full-time, part-time, and occasional drivers. And while these numbers can give us a general idea of what's going on, there's still nothing specific. Luckily, you don't need specific numbers to understand the problem with Uber and other gig economy employers. Uber drivers, like almost all gig economy workers, are technically considered by the company as independent contractors. 
As such, Uber drivers do not get basic things like a minimum wage, health insurance, paid time off, sick days, overtime pay, or any other benefits associated with salaried employment. Every moment that you are not working is money out of your pocket, meaning that those for whom the app is the sole means of revenue have incentives to spend as much of the 100 maximum hours the app allows you to work per week doing just that. This also means that any major injury or sickness or any sudden life event puts drivers and other gig workers in a very precarious position. Uber's entire model leads to overworking and exhaustion, measures that Uber hardly combats with driving caps that still allow most waking hours to be working hours. Reports of drivers sleeping in cars and doing incredibly long stints are not only common, but can be exacerbated by the ability to switch between apps to avoid automatic cutoffs. The kind of move that makes sense when a 40-hour work week isn't enough to avoid literal poverty. And unsurprisingly, Uber benefits tremendously from this arrangement. The freedom to set your own hours discourse has pretty successfully shielded the company from all sorts of criticisms about these kinds of consequences that are very much intentional. Any worker dissatisfied with their earnings, or the amount of work they're doing to earn a meager wage, can be told to simply work harder or smarter. Supposedly, you have the freedom to work as much or as little as you like. So if you aren't happy, you can just adjust those variables. Never mind that what the law is meant to guarantee for someone punching in 40 hours isn't applicable. But there's more to it. Thanks to, let's call it the legal optimization strategy of considering drivers independent contractors, all the costs associated with providing Uber service, getting people from point A to point B in a car, are completely shouldered by drivers themselves. Whether that's buying the car or renting it, paying for the maintenance and the cleaning, paying for insurance, self-employment taxes, income taxes, healthcare, and most importantly, gas, these are all on the driver's dime. Drivers are responsible for all these payments that can take a pretty good gross income, like the one Uber likes to show off, and turn it into a poverty line net salary very quickly. Normally, a company would handle most of these costs and need to provide at least a minimum wage. But thanks to this legal loophole, Uber doesn't. This is what makes the company stand out, and makes it so attractive to investors. For years, in order to make this horrible deal legally viable, Uber has made every effort to portray itself as a simple middleman. Just an app, nothing more. A sort of service that drivers pay for with a cut of their sales, but by no means an employer. Something Uber loves to remind its drivers with the use of the phrase, be your own boss. Uber justifies this by saying that it doesn't set its driver's hours, like a normal business would. Nor does it force its drivers to take rides, the way a salaried employee might be given tasks to accomplish as part of their work. But of course, these are superficial details considering the enormous amount of control Uber still has on its drivers. Using data collected from every ride, every driver, and every rider, Uber toggles variables like price, number of rides, and other important things that drivers are not privy to and cannot negotiate within a range of variability much greater than would ever be normal for an independent contractor. This means that although Uber might not formally work like a traditional employer, the algorithms and policies it has in place effectively give it as much control over its drivers as if it did. Uber can quite suddenly turn the tap off, cut its drivers' earnings, and blame the whole thing on fluctuating demand or the algorithm. But in most places, the law doesn't consider this amount of power over work to be traditional employment. So Uber can keep circumventing labor laws, including some very important ones. In many countries around the world, independent contractors have practically no guarantees, as we've already covered with minimum wage and healthcare being off the table. But more sinister, and less well known, is that in plenty of countries, independent contractors cannot form unions. In the US, under the National Labor Relations Act, for example, only employees are guaranteed this right, meaning that any form of collective bargaining that could raise workers' wages, set more reasonable limits on driving hours, or in any way improve the experience that drivers have with the company is off limits. And now that the public and the state have caught on, gig economy companies are making sure that this extremely lucrative loophole won't disappear. Back in 2020, for example, Uber and Lyft spent $200 million to stop California from classifying Uber drivers as employees. And in 2016, Uber and Lyft lobbyists outnumbered Amazon, Microsoft, and Walmart combined, 
This lobbying powerhouse means that Uber can't fail, even when it does. Recently, for example, the UK formally reclassified Uber drivers as employees. But Uber still held onto its strategy, and therefore its profits, by ensuring that things like minimum wage guarantees would only apply when drivers had a passenger in the car. Something which the app is only able to do 40 to 50% of the time, meaning the minimum wage guarantee is effectively slashed in half. Drivers spend almost half their time on the clock waiting through no fault of their own, but get punished for it. All thanks to Uber's powerful lobbies in yet another perfect example of how pushing the independent contractor story doesn't line up with the traditional employment reality. Clearly, spending all that time waiting conflicts with the whole setting your own hours guarantee an independent contractor should normally be actually guaranteed. Then there's the fact that even if Uber says it's an app for free independent contractors, or people working a couple extra hours as a side hustle, Uber is completely dependent on the people who treat driving for the app as a full-time job to survive. And it proves as much with all its efforts to actively seek them out. Uber would simply not work without functional employees. And as proof, in 2021, the company set aside $250 million for a so-called driver stimulus, desperately trying to attract full-time drivers from its pool of part-time workers. This is because, according to data from the city of Seattle, one-third of Uber's drivers, those that work full-time, provide up to half of all rides. Uber simply couldn't survive without people treating it like a full-time, normal job. But the company can't ever admit this fact without risking labor laws killing their whole business model. In practice, this means that all Uber has done is turn back the clock and called it innovation. It has popularized a model that produces full-time employment without the legal protections earned through decades of militant labor struggles, like the eight-hour workday, the weekend, social security, and so on. It has taken us back to a time where companies hold all the cards, with no exceptions and no governmental regulations to prevent them from pursuing ever more destructive labor policies. And while Uber may not be profitable, despite its now 13-year-long existence, investors continue putting money in and holding their shares because they recognize that this model, with its ability to slash employment costs, is the best chance they have at profitability in the long run. And what's terrible is how little this actually has to do with Uber. The rest of our economy has completely bought in. Today, 70% of Ryanair's pilots are independent contractors. Airplane pilots. And if that doesn't seem crazy enough, several companies are now trying to do the same thing in the healthcare industry, pushing nurses into that same independent contractor status and saving hospitals money. That is, saving hospitals money not by nationalizing healthcare, or preventing insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies from profiting off of people's basic need to continue living and being healthy, or any other sensible measure, but by gutting workers' paychecks. And it's not just a matter of a few examples here and there. Today, 53% of people aged 18 to 24 who work in the gig economy do so as their primary income source. And according to a Princeton study, 94% of the net employment growth in the US between 2005 and 2015 has been in quote unquote, alternative work arrangements, meaning independent contractors, temp work, and freelancing are basically the only new jobs our economy is producing. While we tend to think of companies like Uber and Lyft as the main perpetrators of this shift in work, they actually represent a very small piece of the pie, as little as 0.5% of workers according to that same study. The sad truth is that regulating a few apps won't be enough. Our entire economy now depends on the blatant exploitation of a legal loophole that allows conventional companies to hire conventional employees, call them something else, and get away with a bigger cut of the profit. And although companies like Uber have made their name by blatantly breaking the law and entering markets where protections for workers would have kept them out, in some cases, the transition to precarious gig work has been welcomed by our governments. The Uber files, a leak from earlier this year, revealed that then Minister of the Economy, now President Macron, negotiated with Uber representatives to get the company in France screwing over established taxi drivers, and bringing in a new service that would outcompete them by being more affordable thanks to Uber's own subsidies, and of course the company's reliance on a more exploitative and damaging contract with its employees. 
Confronted with this leak, Macron has even doubled down, stating he would quote, do it again tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. The picture that's emerged from the past few years presents a very grim vision for the future. The trend of precarious work that is poorly paid, unprotected, and maximally exploitative will obviously continue. Governments, beholden to the profit motive and the private interests that lobby them, will continue accommodating this exploitation, happily rolling back the gains of organized labor when they get in the way. Without intense organizing efforts, the future, and frankly the present, is not bright. For decades, people have been told that if they are poor, if they are miserable, that they should just work harder, make money by selling their time and energy to someone who will profit from their exhaustion more than they themselves ever will. It was always a raw deal. But now that even a full week's worth of work isn't enough, that companies gloat when inflation pushes people into more dire poverty, and that our governments welcome these changes with open arms, what could there possibly be left to support? Our labor landscape needs a complete overhaul, and we're not going to get it with politics as usual. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. As I've expressed many times before, YouTube doesn't treat socialist creators very well. Because of this, I rely on viewers like you to maintain my channel. If you like the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. We have everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, to special channels for our neurodivergent and LGBT comrades. I also try to do a live Q&A once a month, which is always a good time. We've built a great little community, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. So if you'd like to help support my channel, join the Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.